Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first Native Plants at Noon for 2021. We are so thrilled to be partnering with the Missouri Department of Conservation uh, to bring you virtual native plant education all year long. So please continue to join us on the third Thursday of each month for live presentations from the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City. Uh, we'll also do a special bonus episode on Thursday, uh, April 22nd for Earth Day. Before we get started, uh, just a few things to keep in mind. If you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A as they occur to you. Uh, we're going to try to kind of pepper those in as we go along rather than having a dedicated question and answer time at the end. For those of you joining us on Facebook, please ask your questions as they occur to you as well, and we'll keep an eye out for those over there. Um, without any further ado, I think we're ready to get started. I'm so excited to introduce you to two of my favorite self-described native plant nerds, Alex Daniel and Sydney Ross. Alex and Sydney have the enviable job title of Native Landscape Specialists with the Missouri Department of Conservation. They both have a lifelong passion for native plants and are excited to share their passion with others. Alex and Sydney, you can take it away. Thank you. Hey guys, welcome. This is Alex Daniel. This is Sydney Ross. Thank you for joining us for our first installment of Native Plants at Noon. You guys ready to go on a walk with us? We're going to be featuring uh, one of our very favorite books, Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Holm. That's what we're talking about today is um, how our native plants can benefit some of our native pollinators during the winter, throughout the year. Um, but we got a lot of great information um, about a few of the species that we're going to be talking about from this book. So we just wanted to plug this. We're going to be referencing it a few times throughout the walk today. And um, if you don't have this, get it. It is such a great book. So let's go for a walk. So this is our Prairie Plaza garden. And this is a garden that we use to display uh, uh, prairie species that do well in the Kansas City area. And we take a couple of different approaches on this. Um, so in some sections, we do a monoculture to show you kind of how the plant um, acts on its own. And then in other parts of the garden, we uh, mix plants together and, and see how they hold each other up, how they interact with each other. Um, but one of my, I don't love monocultures, of course, but one of my favorite monocultures is this one, which is our little blue stem strip that's along the front of our prairie. And I really love this grass because it provides tons of different color throughout the year. And if you go, if you come to the Discovery Center and you see our other little blue stem patch over by our pond, you can see the variety of color that comes with this plant. No long, one. Oh, and um, uh, the, um, uh, I really like it as a hedge grass because it stands up. So this has been knocked over a few times with all the winter storms that we've had. And you can see that it's still standing and still looks really great with very minimal maintenance. Um, another cool thing that we learned about blue stem, a little blue stem this week was that um, beetles use the the, the uh, mounds, um, the, the structure the, at the base of the plant, even if you do cut it down, um, is a great place for beetles to take shelter. And we actually found an American oil beetle out here yesterday that's yes. kind of playing dead in the prairie. <laughs> yeah, so have you ever heard of those? <laughs> I picked it up with my glove. And we I got it to oil <laughs> and then we threw that glove away very quickly. It was cool. It was a cool cool sight to see because they those oil beetles, if you've ever been to the Discovery Center and see these big juicy black shiny beetles they're really beautiful and they'll come out at any sign of warmth or sun um they're coming out and and feeding she actually picked it up yes. as it was eating something it was so cool to see in the middle of January. yeah definitely don't touch them though because yeah, them. hence the name blister beetles they'll leave a nasty little uh burn on you with the oil they, they excrete so yeah, that was kind of cool. a cool find though yeah. yeah that was really cool so the next species we're going to talk about is one of the ones we have in our prairie circles here and these prairie circles were designed to kind of isolate these species so that we could see them 
on their own because some of them are getting kind of swallowed up in um, the bigger prairie plantings. And so we can kind of see how these plants act as a either a monoculture, maybe two species in a circle. Um, for instance, this one, this is one of my favorite ones. This is our Rudbeckia circle. So when I first started learning plants and I'm going to admit that here's here's one of the Rebecca's. Isn't that nice? Look at that. Yeah, look at that winter. contrast. Yeah, it's so that. beautiful. It's such a beautiful um dark. I love how dark the uh, seed heads are combined with how kind of silvery gray and downy the stems can be on this one. Um, but this Rebecca circle has five different native rudbeckias in it and we kind of built it as a tool to learn the different rudbeckias as they grow side by side so you can see all different all the five different species kind of growing together here in this circle and what this provides in the winter time is food of course we've got birds now when we would go to try and pull one of these apart you can see that there's actually not many seeds left in here because these have been picked apart by songbirds um, that are feeding on the seeds and will continue to feed on these seeds all winter. So that's one of the reasons to leave the leaves. If you can, if you have the opportunity, if it fits in with your aesthetic or if you can make it fit in with your aesthetic, um, leaving your plants all the way up is really the ideal because you're providing that food source at the top with the seeds. You're also helping to uh, helping your plants to uh, seed themselves and and spread themselves around um, and then you're also leaving all that organic material to be broken down in a natural way in the way that it normally would um, in the wild of course you could set it on fire that's a different way to do it <laughs> that's always in, one way to do it right that's state. definitely the exciting way to do that's it the next piece is I wanted to show you, just because I love it so much and it provides so much winter beauty, is Rattlesnake Master. This is one of my favorite plants and it quickly becomes a lot of people's very favorite prairie plant because it has so much going for it. First of all, I'll work up to the winter beauty part. First of all, it has this gorgeous base foliage that looks like yucca folium is a Latin name, and it's it has a yucca-like uh, base foliage at the bottom. And those leaves can be used to make cordage. They can be um, uh, they can be processed really easily to turn into thread-like bits that are rolled and then that you can braid into cordage. So we use this plant a lot for our programs at the Discovery Center that deal with um, making cordage. Um, and then another thing that I love about this plant is obviously the shape. Now it's got these gorgeous upright stems and these stems have withstood, I'm gonna say this about a lot of these plants, but <laughs> these stems have withstood this winter, this winter where we've had you know, what was that a few weeks ago, we had, what was it, six inches of snow. Yeah. So these plants have stood up through all of that. And they've, which gives them a really great structure. When we're talking about winter beauty. You want to talk about plants that can hold themselves up even when they're not in maybe like an intact prairie system. Normally this plant and all of these plants would be um, growing together out in the wild and therefore for holding each other up, but that's not ever realistic when you're talking about an urban planting or any kind of um, planned planting. So what what's great to do is to find your companion plants and find out who holds what up. And, and Rattlesnake Master is definitely one of those. Little Blue Stem is absolutely a companion plant for most of these prairie plants because it's going to provide that structure that prairie plants would normally have when they're all growing together and hold each other up throughout the winter. What I also like about those companion plants is the visual aspect. So you have these nice bold shapes with like say rattlesnake master, red beckia, um, and any other kind of flowering species. And you pair that with something like little blue stem or some other grasses, you get some nice uh, variety in textures and colors. So it makes your winter garden very beautiful, even if there aren't flowers in bloom. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this, 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 actually this plant looks kind of just like this only lightish yeah. bluish greenish but it kind of basically just looks like this when it's You're in the right. flower too it's mm -hmm. such a great flower oh and to bring up heather holmes book we just very quickly this plant is, is frequented by the great 
di uh, great gold digger wasp and um we ha we saw that wasp here last year and so i'm going to be watching this rattlesnake master for that wasp eating because it's so cool it's really cute so if you but if alex, you don't have the hey alex things, we have a quick question here yeah, go right ahead before you leave the prairie circles will you just really quickly mention what the edging is that was used to make those oh yeah so these are culverts is that what yeah they're called? yeah so they're they're like um irrigation pipes um they're like the connectors um between like giant irrigation pipes and this was all the idea of uh, mr pat whalen we got a cameo here <laughs> hi pat <laughs> wave to the camera pat hi. He's one of our naturalists here. Yeah. Yes. So that was his idea to kind of separate these species out so we could see them. And um, I see I see it actually in a lot of like community gardens, gardens around Kansas City. I think people are using more um, uh, these kind of culverts. They're, they, we, we bury them very deeply into the ground here and they're three feet wide is what he's telling me. Yeah, three feet Do you wide. know about how deep these went in the ground? About three, three feet. feet in the into the ground. Well, some of them, okay. you can see that little bluesome one right there only went one foot in. This one went two feet in. I see. So okay. some of them, they're at various heights depending on the species that we put into them. So what I wanted to speak about next is um, what you can do if you don't, if you can't leave plants standing up, if that's not an option for you, just give you a few, um, uh, uh, ideas for what you could do. So here we have a bed that we've mulched with leaf mulch. And these are just, oak, these are mostly oak leaves and they were um, put into a shredder and mulched up. And we love this kind of mulch because it really stays. Like it's, if you lay it down, it really um, does not blow away oh, at man. all. And it's so nice and it's already breaking down yeah. really nicely. It's gonna become organic material um very soon <laughs> i wish you guys could smell it, it smells, it smells so, so nice good. it's so yeah, good yeah it really, really good. but those nutrients are so important to give your plants the the strength to get through these yeah. different changing seasons yeah. yeah and we were talking to a friend the other day about using oak leaves for mulch because oak leaves don't break down they're very like they have a very t tough texture and they don't break down quite as quickly as other kinds of leaves or other kinds of mulch so they really act as a great um weed barrier and we've had a few beds where we just have had to remulch every couple of years with this with this uh, ground up leaf mulch so if you're grinding up your leaf mulch or grinding up your leaves to make mulch, there's a chance that you are grinding up the insects that are overwintering on these leaves. For instance, sorry about that. For instance, we have a gall here on this piece of leaf. It's very small, here, um, but it that would be uh, an insect um, larva, perhaps had. Um, hatched out of that, or it may be still in there. Um, but these are the kinds of things that you might be losing when you mulch up your leaves. Um, what, <laughs> so why I like to use whole leaf mulch is because you'll find things like this. Oh, can you see it? Can you see it? This is a polyphemus moth cocoon and look at that it looks like nothing it looks like it, looks, leaf, right? it looks like a leaf this is, is leaves mostly it still even has the pattern uh of the leaf that was used to mold the outside of it now based on the hole that's actually on this i think it probably was a a wasp that uh, probably a uh, paras uh, parasitic wasp that that hatched out of that but it would have been a had the wasp not come along and done what wasp parasitic wasps do and it would have been a polyphemus moth. So when you're crunching up your leaves, you're you're getting rid of these kinds of things, and so you're 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 making that break in the ecosystem where that would have been a food source for another bird or an adult insect. So anyway, that's one way you can do brush piles. And then one of our other favorite ways, well, one of our most artsy ways to do brush piles our actual breath pile. Um, so we have a smaller one here. And what we love to do here at the Discovery Center is make brush piles and then wait around and see how long it takes for there to become a door on the brush pile. 
So on this one, it's got at least two entrances that are probably from rabbits. You gotta guess it's rabbits, um, but there, it's obviously providing shelter here. And then on the bigger broad side, this one had a little bit more structure to it. It was bigger branches and we used twine to hold it together around a central point. And this one quickly got doors. Yeah, what do you think went in there? Well, I don't think it was squirrels. I don't <laughs> think it was rabbits. I think it was those little, what do you call those little animals that are like, they're like this tall, they're really fast. They're, they're loud, they, they run, run around. Yeah. Oh, children? Children. children? children, that's what they are. Okay, great. I made shelter in this. <laughs> So <laughs> depending on what kind of brush oil you can get going, any kind of habitat you can provide in your yard, you might get, you know, a bigger and bigger animal all the way up, all the way up inside. So do we have any questions right now before I do a demonstration? Yes, thank you for asking. So um, let's see, Deborah would like you to repeat the, It was was it a polyphemus cocoon that you had? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so I'll I'll type that in the chat here in a moment, Deborah, um, so that you could look into that more. And then a question from Val says, "I've been told oak leaves in a prairie style garden are inappropriate for those plants." Uh, she's been trying to pull out leaves that blow into her prairie planting. Um, what advice do you have for her on that? That is such a good question, and there is a very complicated answer about this. Um, we, so on this bed specifically, we use these oak leaves. This is on a plant that's going to come back later in the season. It's going to be for common milkweed. Now, I would never mulch a bed with oak leaves that's, that has a spring blooming plant, something that's going to grow, that's going to, that needs that space on the earth to, to grow. But there's oaks on the prairies, there are savannas, there are oaks around the edges of prairies. It, it That's such a great question and I could address that later on. But yes, oak leaves are not for every bed. They're not for every bed. But here's one way that you can mulch in a bed with the own material. So now Alex is going to demonstrate how she cuts uh, the, this is a little blue stem here in this prairie circle. Bit, sorry, excuse me, big blue stem. All the seeds in there. Right. So she's cutting it in with a hedge trimmer to keep all the seeds contained into this bed. Yeah, kind of. You can see she's starting from the top, working her way down. Her motions are cutting into the center of the bed, and that helps keep some of the seeds in the in the area that she's desired. Great job. Awesome. Very little cleanup. You're still providing habitat for any animals or insects that are in there. And you're putting that organic material back in. And see. Awesome. And we're going to hand it off. Here you go. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, guys. Sydney here. I'm going to show you a few more plants that I really enjoy seeing in the winter in my garden. If you want to follow me, we're going to walk this way. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free, uh, Sarah, to go ahead and ask those while we're making our way over to the next stop. Okay, yes, we have a few. Um, first question, uh, boy, actually, we have quite a few. So what were the reinforcements on those larger brush piles? Can you mention what that was? The larger reinforcements, well, we, we definitely use uh, plants that have very sturdy stalks, like compass plant, uh, crown beer, but then we also use twine to keep the actual brush pile intact. We just wrap just some string, kind of wrap it around and tie it into place. We started that one with, um, whoops, sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, we started that one with three branches that were propped up in each other, like, you would start like a TP like a, a yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like a tripod shape. Yep, yeah. just a tripod shape. And then we kept adding tall stuff onto it. We added smaller stuff onto the edges. You can add smaller stuff inside. And if you're creative like me, I like to think about the different colors and textures. 
and kind of be intentional about what plants I'm putting where on that brush pile. But you don't have to get that into it if you don't want to, but it can be kind of fun. What other Artful brush we piles. Have? We love it. Artful uh, brush piles. That's right. So uh, two questions here. Barb and Susan uh, both have questions about when is the best time to trim back plants? Um, do you ideally leave most of them up throughout the whole winter? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's important to leave up if you can, if you're, you know, if you don't have a homeowners association, um, or, or even if you like do that, fight it, fight it. <laughs> have conversations with them, explain why it's important to, um, our native insects and birds and other animals. But I recommend leaving your plants up through the end of April, if you can, that way, and anything March, that's yeah. overwintering in the stems, uh, has the opportunity to hatch once the weather gets warmer. Yeah, we usually, yeah, end of March through April. I mean, that's ideal. If you can wait that long, that's so great. If you can wait that's... even longer, better. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just kind of depends on what your needs are for your home and garden. Yeah. But brush um, piles are a great way to like keep that material on your land without, you know, ask, cutting it down right. still, but keeping the, that plant material in your land. Do we have one um, more question before we move on? Yeah. Yeah, Matt asks uh, from Facebook, what is the latest time in the year that you can um, cut things back and um, mulch them up before you run the risk of um, killing the next season's insects? Uh, late March is what the consensus seems to be, um, but wait as long as you can. <laughs> wait two weeks into April if you want to. But late March seems to be the, the uh, consensus on um, how uh, the, the least detrimental time to, uh, if you're, if you're trying to consider overwintering insects in your garden. Great, Great questions, Thank you. everybody. Great question. All right. So now we're here at kind of one of the most basic native plants you can find here in Kansas City. But not basic, like not basic, but everybody should have this plant. Everyone should start with yes, this Yes. It's a great foundational plant. This yes. is Echinacea, purple cone flower. There's a lot of different types of species, including yellow cone flower, pale purple cone flower, but this is just straight up purple cone flower. And if you are new to native gardening, again, this is what you should start off having in your garden. Um, you can see it in the winter time, it stands up really well. It has these beautiful erect stems with seed heads that remain intact. Um, not only is it beautiful when snow falls on it, you get that nice contrast of the white snow and the dark seed heads. But it's also a really important food source for finches, specifically the goldfinch. So wintertime is a great time to study or just enjoy the presence of migratory songbirds. Um, and if you have um, free food in your yard for these birds, you're more likely to see them in your own backyard. Yeah, they will show up. Yeah, they'll be here. So yeah, this is again, kind of a basic uh, plant to include in your native garden, but it's, it's a, you get the whole bang for your buck with it. It's beautiful. And it provides a lot of ecological value. And I love it too, because it can handle, I mean, it's technically a part shade species. Um, so it can handle some shade and yeah. also full, full blasting sun. I mean, I had planted it in my front yard in full deep shade and it still did well. Uh, yeah. It establishes itself very easily, spreads by seed. Yeah, yeah it's a good plant. <gasps> oh, Sydney, what's that? Oh gosh, come here. Check this wow, out. look at that. What is, is that, that weird thing on that? stem i think that's a gall alex oh, tell yeah. tell our uh folks what 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 is that oh that's a gall for sure so what is a gall a gall is a um can i take can i switch it actually yeah. Yeah, one a gall is a um where a an insect has laid an egg in the stem of a plant and the um the the egg inside of there um causes the plant to create this kind of home for the egg so this is there are a few different beetles that have um gall that use uh gold rods to form their galls and have um their babies uh, mature in but this one is extra cool because you can see that it's got a kind of new hole in it and that means that a bird tried to get in there so let's see what's inside What's in there? Wow. Oh, it's nothing. But There's that's nothing. where the larva would have been had there been a larva inside of there. Yeah. So that's a really important food species for, or food for um, uh, woodpeckers. Yeah. Woodpeckers, they will go after gulls because they know there's a juicy little tidbit in there. Yeah. And it just leads back to that, that idea of there's a lot of food scarcity for wildlife during the winter. 
So the more you leave your plants up, the more opportunity for not only habitat, but food for birds and other wildlife. Yeah. All right, now over here, we have a couple more species we wanna cover real quick. <gasps> real quick, real quick. This one is Penstemon digitalis, which is foxglove beard tongue. And I love this plant because the seed heads persist in the winter. They're very delicate little bell-shaped uh, seeds. And then if you look down at the basil foliage, it still has nice green color. And look, look at, at that, that purple. It's still green. It's still green. Look at that. It's, it's good all through winter, this plant stays. And it's so it's awesome. Even if you decide to cut the seed heads back, you still have this awesome ground covery base foliage that stays all winter. Yeah, so I think that's just a really nice, uh, beautiful um, flower that you can include into your garden. And can I mention yes. all the, okay, so the flowers, Attract long tongued bees, yes. bumblebees, That's so carpenter cool. bees. So yeah. you can tell by the shape of the seed pod that these used to have kind of a tubular flower. Yeah. So um, plants and insects have evolved over thousands of years to adapt to each other. So there's only certain types of bees that are able to pollinate plants like that. Yeah, you need a long body. And my fit one of my favorite, a long time. And I have hundreds and hundreds of pictures of little bee butts that are sticking out of Pinsman Digitalis because it's so cute. You just can't not take a cute picture of cute bee butts. You can't. I mean, come on, that's what springtime is all about. Bee butts. Okay, so two more plants I want to talk about over here real quick in terms of their kind of visual qualities. We have button bush right here. Look at that. Look how dramatic that is. So goth. It's so goth. I love it. I think it just really stands out, especially when you are, when you have those like dreary winter days. Oh yeah. It's just so nice. And uh, in this, the uh, early summertime, these little balls here are white and fluffy. They kind of remind me something out of Dr. Seuss book. They're just really fun. Everyone loves them. Hummingbirds, bees, people. People. Yeah. They're usually covered in butterflies and then me taking pictures of the butterflies. And then people butterflies. coming up and taking photos so, of yes, them. So yes, they're unreal. So the good. flowers are unreal. Yeah, and then over here we also have, oh. let's see. Can you do that one? This is Monarda fistulosa, which is also known as uh, wild bergamot. So I just like the shape of these two types of plants in particular. Whoops. That works. <laughs> that works. <Yeah. laughs> so that kind of um, round globe shape. Um, I do like how the Monarda has kind of a more silver like quality to it. And in the fall, um, what's also cool with Monarda, it is wild bergamot. So you can actually harvest the leaves and make tea out of it. It tastes really nice. So. Yeah, it's a really great yeah. culinary herb. Yeah. It's one of the, yeah, it's in the mint family. Yeah. Didn't you say you made like a cream cheese or something? Yes. Like I, that? Yes. <laughs> it's a, sa it's more of a savory. It's yeah, it's on the savory side of yeah. mints. Um, so it's really good for like savory teas. Native Americans used it to cure um, or to season meats. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't tried that yet, but that sounds really good. Yeah, it's used in a lot of herbalism as well. So. Yeah. Okay, and we're going to talk about one more plant here today that I love in my garden during winter. And that is blue false indigo, which is Baptisia australis. It's this plant here. You can see it's kind of like a darker a grayish, slightly green color. It stands out in these golden grasses here. Uh, what's cool about this plant is that um, it has these beautiful seed pods. Rattle pod. Yes. Rattle pod. That's another common name for it. Rattle pod. The rattle pod. Mm -hmm. So if you come over here, do that. It has very distinct seed pods. And um, they usually have seeds on the inside and when you shake them, they rattle. So a lot of folks um, will plant sensory gardens for children. And this is a great uh, specimen for that because as Alex said, when you shake it, it rattles. Another interesting thing about the seed pod is that it is used as a home for a couple insects. Um, during the summer when the pods are forming, there is a Baptisia weevil that will come in. The female will take its long snout and drill a hole right into the seed pod and lay her eggs. And then the grubs will kind of push the seeds out. They might even eat a little bit of it. And then they hatch and move on with their cycle. And then later in the year, come fall, we'll have spiders go through and um, take up residence in these seed pods as well. Yeah, and we found spiders in this, the actual stems too. We cut the hollow stems yeah. open of this plant. We have found spiders and other native insects. Um, hanging out in there that persist yeah. yeah so what the last thing i want to say about this plant um 
besides that in the springtime, this is probably my favorite plant of the year right now. Uh, it has these bright, vivid blue flowers. I mean, it's unlike any color you've ever seen. So definitely check it out in the spring and the leaves are beautiful too, but it's one of Missouri's tumbleweeds. So you can just simply tear it out like this um, at, during the winter if you want i mean it if sometimes can, will blow away so, yes yeah. it will blow away it we will usually blow, away. blow all of ours just blow themselves they usually away. do they're going down the sidewalk but that is a specialized aspect of this plant because the seeds need to be scarified in order to germinate and so it's it's an easy upkeep plant um you don't need to trim it during the springtime we'll show you that in a few months but it's i've gotten this one, one to bloom twice too if you deadhead it, it yeah. after it blooms you can get it to bloom twice That's just perfect. a little trick yeah yeah. Well, perfect. Thank you for joining us for our first installment. Yes, of Native thank Plants you. Oh, thank you really so much. It. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Alex. This has been just such a fun way to start the afternoon. Um, let's do just one quick question uh, here. I know folks have kind of winter cleanup and those sorts of things on the brain. So um, Karen asks if the brush piles get cleaned up at a certain point. Yeah, so in the, at the end of March, early April, we will pick up the brush piles and it's actually one of my favorite things to do because we um, get to see who's in there. We get to see who was in there, yeah. what evidence was left over. Uh, we usually find beetles. We always find snakes. My favorite. Time, I yes. love it when we find little garter yes. snakes oh or gosh. decay uh, wait, snakes. Wait, wait, very yeah. quick story. I, we had some visitors from Belgium one time and they were like, we want to see a snake. We don't, I don't know if they didn't have snakes for it. But anyway, I was like, really? You want to see a snake? This was in late March. We picked up the, one of the brush piles out there. Huge! There was a huge <laughs> garter snake in there, and I got to like let them interact with it in a nice way. They're and so it was cool. A, it was a warm day too, so I didn't feel bad about bringing up waking it up. Snake. Yeah, yeah, but it was really cool. So, uh, yeah, so we do get rid of them at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic! Thank you so much. Um, if you still have questions, um, you can visit our. Facebook page, uh, look up Deep Roots Casey on Facebook. Um, and if you find this video and want to enter some more questions in the comments of this video, I know uh, Sydney and Alex have graciously agreed to go back um, at uh, a later time here this afternoon and um, add some more comments there. So um, to answer a few more of your questions. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the native landscape at the Discovery Center, uh, you can sign up for First Friday Landscape Chats, uh, bundle up and bring your mask on the first Friday of each month. Uh, and Alex will guide you around the landscaping and answer your questions. Registration is required uh, and you need to visit the link on your screen there. Uh, that will take you just to the events at the Discovery Center on MDC's website. While you're there, um, you may also check out the virtual program, uh, which happens both on February 2nd and 13th, where Sydney will discuss winter beauty of native plants in a virtual class that you can enjoy from home. We also invite you to visit deeproots.org. Um, you can click on the events tab to find upcoming webinars, plant sales, and more. While you're there, please consider making a donation to Deep Roots uh, to help us continue our native plant education programs. So that's all for today. We look forward to seeing you at our next Native Plants at Noon on February 18th. And take care. Thank you again, Sydney and Alex. Thanks so much. <laughs>